Okay, looks like we are live. Welcome everybody. You got Chris Martin here, um, Jerry Herb, Daryl Wiggins, Dennis Laguerre. We're getting down to Gated Wise tonight. It's a fun from hosting from your kid's basement, right? Anyway, welcome everybody. Um, Jerry, you want to give a quick shout out here before we get started? Yeah, yeah, Jerry Herbst. Um, I just want to let you know, uh, Safe Fleet and Elkhart Brass, all our companies are up and going, uh, albeit with some alternative methods. Um, we, we, we meet the criteria and are part of the critical infrastructure, so we're essential and our, our factories are still making product every day. Um, we're still available as a resource, but our, our field people have been grounded uh, for our safety as well as the people we deal with. Uh, if you do need something, reach out. Uh, we've we've come become quite creative. We're still shipping product out for for uh, demos and training and evaluation and things of that nature. We'll do what we can. Um, we're all challenged by moving forward the way things are right now. So we'll find more unique ways as, as we get the opportunities. But uh, we're here for you. So please reach out if you need to. Cool. Um, and we got Daryl Liggins, captain on the Oakland Fire Department, and uh, Dennis Laguerre, retired captain from Oakland, also uh, runs a Laguerre Engineering and Consulting. You guys are familiar with them from our brass tax videos, certainly. And before we really get into the gated Y thing, um, I think this is the perfect place to bring up Dennis's beard. I mean, we're all going through some, some pretty creative, you know, grooming situations right now with everything shut down. But I would say we got several comments throughout the series of like, who's this dude with the beard in the fire home, <laughs> right? So, uh, and we had a serious conversation about like, does he shave the beard? Then not nobody's gonna know what he looks like. The beard's kind of iconic at this point. So uh, Dennis, would you like to defend your beard before we start? Well, I, you know, I had 20 years of living under a uniform code. So, you know, I, uh, that ended and I was like, well, why do I have to shave? I don't have to wear an SCBA anymore. And then uh, I think humans are inherently lazy by nature. It's just uh, <laughs> kind of nice. And then uh, my wife likes it. So um, all and right. Then, and now, okay. and now it's an iconic beard. Any firefighter <laughs> place I go to, they I get identified from across the room. That's right. So, so all you people on, on Facebook that are commenting about Dennis's beard, man, let it go. The guy's retired. All right. <laughs> The wealth of knowledge, but uh, so anyway, let's get into to some of that knowledge here, and uh, and go deep here on the gated Y. So, guys, want to get us started off? We talked we talked a lot in in the video. We talked a lot about flows, right? So, um, if you want to go back and rewatch the video, um, we've posted on our Facebook page. You go to brasstaxhardfacts.com. There's an extended version, it's about 13 minutes. It gets into the whole hydraulic parity issue, which is an issue, right? So uh, tonight we wanna to talk a little bit about um, other things that you might not think of, but also offer some solutions and where the Y still might work, right? So this isn't a whole anti-gated Y scenario. So um, why don't you get rolling there, Dennis, sorry. Um, why don't you put up uh, slide number two? Okay. And I think what's most important when you're trying to consume new information or take a different look at things uh, is to have an open mind. You know, you have to you have to have the ability to uh, understand a different perspective. And uh, Tolstoy, um, uh, I I like this slide. I like I like the commentary on the why, but I like the commentary on life here. You know, the most difficult subjects can be explained to the most slow-witted man if he has not formed any idea of them already. But the simplest thing cannot be made clear to the most intelligent man if he is firmly persuaded that he knows already, without a shadow of a doubt, what is laid before him. And I think it's the why is the perfect example of that. You look at it and you go like, huh, it splits one line into two. How complicated can it be? What are the actual impacts? And, you know, Daryl's going to go into that in detail. Um, I've had very good success uh, in large and small fire departments removing this device from structural fire, uh, residential and, and family, multiple dwelling fires and having them be very happy with the results, you know, feeling that the fires go out faster and it's an easier deployment. And Daryl has some really good points about that. But uh, 
just to tell you, you know, people have asked for years. There was the few stuff I've been written and it's been out from my company into fire departments, but uh, fire engineering, it made it past the technical review, you know, why operations, tactical and strategic problems. I really think there's more tactical and strategic problems than most people think. This is from the February 2019 water supplemental from fire engineering. Anybody can download it. It's free. I don't think you need a subscription. You just type in water supplemental 2019 fire engineering. There's a bunch of good articles in there. Uh, but this talks about not only the hydraulic problems, but the strategic problems and it presents solutions. So it's good. It's a good piece of reference. Uh, you want to weigh in Daryl? I'm good with that slide. Uh, Chris. Yeah, I, I think just starting off, anybody watching, uh, there's a public comment area here. And if you have any questions, go ahead and it would be a good way to uh, ask the questions if you're watching uh, live. But first of all, we're not advocating at all that gated wise do not work. But I do think as um, departments have been increasing their flows, we've had a lot of uh, people just simply adding another nozzle, you know, a higher flow nozzle to their line and ending up with some uh, hydraulic complications. And that's what we were trying to get, uh, get across in the brass tax videos. But they do work. They work across this country in, in small departments and large departments. It uh, doesn't mean that uh, not having them can, can also work. But we have successful fire departments such as uh, Detroit and Chicago and uh, San Francisco across the bay from from me that use these devices quite often. But we also have large departments like uh, uh, Los Angeles or Oakland or FDNY that don't use these devices at all and are equally as successful. But what I want people to understand is some of the hydraulic complications, but also some of the the operational issues that you can have. Um, operating with these devices rather than uh, just slapping a new nozzle on and expecting everything to work as if it worked uh, in the past because that's when we can really end up with some severe hydraulic uh, difficulties. If, if we were to take a department like uh, Detroit, for example, they're, they're still using what we would maybe consider as like a legacy flow of 125. So if all of a sudden you wanted to add a 200 at 75 nozzle to the end, it can really cause some hydraulic issues uh, to the point where uh, it, it's not going to work as well as it did before. Um, we, hey, Daryl. Hey, Daryl. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so real ahead. quick, you, got a, you have a bad echo. We're getting a lot of comments that you don't, you don't sound the greatest. I don't know okay. what changed from our practice run to the dry run, but... See if the headphones are. I think in. maybe um, if anybody's not That's talking, if you mute it, then we may not be echoing back through. So just make sure it's muted. Did that get rid of the echo? Yes. Yeah. You're good. Okay. So um, we have to look at uh, some uh, that the possibility of not having that Y can uh, simplify operations for the firefighters, for the engineer, and also um, correct some hydraulic issues that you may have. Not for one line operating, but really it's when you open up that second line is when you can start having some uh, some issues. Um, I did take some uh, pictures. Chris, are you going to be ready to put any of those? Yeah, you let me know, man. I can, I can pop up whatever you yeah. want here. So um, I just wanted to show uh, some of the issues that I see just from the company perspective. If you, if you could put up that uh, picture where I had any town USA up. Uh, stand by. Is that the, the Gotham FD? No, that would be the last one. So any town. So it's just a initial attack line algorithm. Oh, yep. Stand by. Okay. So if you guys take a look at this, when a firefighter steps off the rig, they have to make a decision. And the first decision they have to make is an inch and three quarter line or a two and a half inch line. Uh, some departments may not have a two and a half and some departments may even have a two inch in there. So once they make that decision, now they're estimating the stretch and they're deciding 
are they using a 150 pre-connect, a 200 pre-connect, a 300 maybe Minuteman load off the rear? Are they using, uh, if it's longer than the 300, are they going to extend a two and a half or three inch with a Y and then hook a bundle to the end? Or maybe they're going to pull a pre-connect and then extend a bundle to the end there. So you can see we're expected to be professionals and good at every position from firefighter, backup, officer, at all of those evolutions for that inch and three quarter. And then we may have the two and a half where we have a 150 uh, pre-connect or blitz line, some may call it, and a static bed. So these are some of the things that we have to not only be good at, in the companies, we have to have our probationaries good at this. We have to have the academy proficient at all of this. And if you can bring up the Gotham FD, AKK, -A, <laughs> also known as AKA FDNY, this is how simple that some departments are. That firefighter is choosing a one and three quarter or a two and a half, and they're going to the bulk bed, no matter if that stretch is short or long and that's going to be a lot easier for everybody on that rig to be more proficient and also uh you know kind of be on the same same page it's going to be easier to host your academies and everything else because no matter if it's short or long it's always the same stretch and i think we become over dependent on wise for that outlier situation for a lot of departments where it's only used for a long stretch uh we can just go to that last picture of the stretches. Okay. And once we select the line, now we got to figure out the stretch. If, is it a horizontal stretch, which is what we're dealing with most of the time? A short stretch, we often use a pre-connect. But if it's a long stretch, a lot of departments now have to do something completely different because the stretch is over 300 feet. And I ask, why do we have to have a different stretch because, the, because it's over 300 feet or over 200 feet and now it's 350? Okay, so this is where in a long stretch, somebody may uh, opt for like a gated Y operation or something. And then also we have to know all of our vertical stretches. Are we going up the stairs, the well hole, rope bag, pike pole, ladders? standpipe ops. We also have to be good at all those vertical stretches with all those different loads. So for me, the elimination of the Y for a lot of uh, departments is just simplicity. So we can choose an inch and three quarter or two and a half and then focus on the on the proper stretch. That, that's it there, Chris. Uh, Dennis, you want to weigh in on that or yeah, I had my uh, mic muted based on your advice. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, so um, Chris, why don't you bring up slide number three there with the green print on it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna weigh in and add some of the stuff to what Daryl said. Um, so you know, I I do that national lecture hydrants to nozzles, and in there there's a component. When I get down to handline stretches, there's always a component where I talk about why operations and, and simplicity. And uh, often uh, excellence is achieved through removal, not addition. If you remove items you don't need, it can get you to focus on things that you do need. So these are some of the things that you have to have to properly pump a hand line. So first you need a gold standard hose lay, okay? The gold standard hand hose lay is one outlet, one line with a known friction loss between the uh, outlet and the nozzle and a known nozzle pressure. So, you know, an example of this in the standpipe world, if you, uh, if you approach a standpipe equipped building and you can quickly get to the fire with a rig stretch, it's often much better to stretch off the rig than the standpipe because a standpipe adds variables. Is the FDC going to work? Does the fire pump kick on? Is the outlet going to be correct? Is there going to be a shut off or an obstruction between me and my nozzle? So the gold standard hose lay is always off the engine. And the simplest gold standard hose lay is that nozzle pressure that you know, friction loss in your known hose fleet, and that single outlet. So if you end up losing a pressure, is it a kink or did the hose burst or burn through? 
Uh, if they if they're saying they don't have enough pressure, you know, there's just a few answers. There's no extra variables. So removing variables is very important. So to make your pump discharge pressure, you need to know your target flow, right? Uh, a Y operation automatically gives you two flows to pump to, right? Are you going to pump for one line, which is what you'll do initially, and then someone will take the other line, and you're going to have to increase discharge pressure. And based on how good that trunk line is hydraulically uh, is how much problem you're going to have with the hydraulic balancing issue. We have to remember historically, uh, often the inch and a half only flowed 60 to 90 gallons a minute. And now our inch and three quarters flowing 150 to 185. So at a minimum, you should supply it with three inch. Um, kind of inch and a half supplied by a three inch trunk line where they flow 100 gallons a minute each, which was an evolution we kind of had in Oakland before we increased our uh, target flow. You could, you could stretch that 400 feet and that'd work fine, right? Um, one thing I definitely teach when I teach pump panel operations is that you should mark your outlet, right? Um, so I, I would write on the gauge what company initially pulled my line, right? And I'd write the location because the location needed to be on there in case they go through a single bottle. And now I, someone says, hey, I have a problem on division two with water. I look at my pump panel. Oh, that's outlet number two on my pumper. It's probably my line. I can fix it. Why start calling into question whether you can mark your pump panel accurately. Where are the lines? Who are on them? Where are they going? So I think you you have a line commitment issue pumping a Y where you can have some unknowns. Can it be fixed with radio traffic? Sure. Uh, line responsibility, you know, uh, commitment and life safety. You know, if the trunk line burns through, you lose both. If one of the lines burn through, it takes the water from the other line until you untie the thing you tied open and you close it. So you have all these variables where you could have constants. So I think uh, what Daryl said, he brought up like New York. People go like, oh, I'm not as big as New York. He brought up LA, I'm not as big as LA. Well, there's a lot of fire departments that when they go long or even at all times don't have any pre-connected line that are small. Palo Alto, California, it's structure fires. They don't use any pre-connected line. Uh, Vancouver, Washington, just north of Portland, they don't use any pre-connected line. They don't use Y operations. Sohomish County in Washington. Um, and, and, the list, and the list goes on. And there's uh, there. It's just kind of a little forgotten area of the fire service. So, you know, we, you have to understand that the, there are departments that have intentionally kept the why out of their evolution to simplify that algorithm down to a few choices. If you get it down to two, three choices uh, total, and you can practice, let's say 20 times a year, and you have three choices, well, it's only, you get to practice each evolution seven times. If you can get it down to two choices, you get to practice each evolution 10 times. If you end up having five or six options, it means you're gonna have less muscle memory, less time drill. It's gonna be a more perishable skill set. It's gonna be a more complicated skill set. And now you're letting the piece of equipment dictate not only your fire ground operations, but your training operations. And ultimately on the fire ground, it's my firm belief that getting the line in place and getting water flowing should be one of the simplest things done. Your company officer should be focused on uh, 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 situational awareness, where the crew is, where the fire is. The firefighter should be focused on having the nozzle open and having a constant pressure. And the why causes a significant issue in all those things going smoothly. And it's rarely used. Uh, Dennis, one thing I was thinking about uh, what you were just talking about is having things uh, simple and brought down to just a, uh, a couple of options. And you and I have both worked in other organizations and use gate to Y operations quite a bit in our previous organizations. And I have brought up uh, the Chicago Fire Department and the Detroit Fire Department. Those are examples of departments that have very simple operations, they do have very few choices and are good at what they do because that is their short 
too long stretch where a lot of departments, it's a recovery for a longer stretch than their pre-connected lines are gonna reach. So when the Chicago Fire Department uh, stretches an inch and three quarter off the bed, it's always going to be connected with that Y, similar to a Detroit. But it puts all those firefighters on the same page and they get very good at the stretch that they're doing because that is their number one game plan. Hey, Chris, uh, I know you can't speak, but can you bring up slide number five? Anything for you, Dennis? So this, this slide that Chris is bringing up is kind of going to show uh, some of the stuff that Daryl uh, was talking about. Um, one thing that I found annoying about Y operations, and they were present when I first got to Oakland, was that I think the piece of equipment dictates the second company's actions. If you hear on a radio, someone's doing a Y operation, you're automatically driven as the second new company officer. Okay, I need my bundle. I need to go to where the first line is. And then the Y is there, it's talking to me. Please, please touch me. I, I need attention. So you'll lose a member, they're down on a knee, they're screwing it on, uh, you know, me, the first line needs to be, did it go to the right place? Is it making progress? Are there enough hands on it? Is it kink free? Then let's think about our second line. Now, uh, I remember distinctly one fire in Oakland. It was on a hill. So we had a sub-level fire, sub-level one, and then division one. The grade, uh, the fire started in the sub-level. It exposed up to division one. It was a three-story building, sub-level one, division one, division two. And uh, it was kind of a long driveway back to this back unit apartment. So they did a Y operation down there. And the second company brought up a Y, I mean, brought up a bundle, went down to the Y and started hooking up to the Y. And then they realized their exposure, division one was on fire. Well, they brought that nozzle back up the driveway and went in the front door. My rigs parked pretty close to the front. So essentially the Y dictated the second company officer's actions not because he was a bad company officer it's because when you hear why evolution you automatically go to where the why is so um you know that's a line commitment issue you know it makes it difficult for the pump operator um there's always an interruption in flow you know when you when you open that second discharge on a why it's going to substantially lower the flow on the first line um, visibility issues i think when the why was initially uh, thought up of is an evolution. There were a couple reasons that was necessary. First, you know, pump pump panels only had a couple outlets, so often they were on the rig. Second, rig, uh, engine companies didn't get issued a lot of small hose, and it was a way to use their small allotment of hose away from the rig uh, uh, in a manner where they could get two lines. If they only had four lengths of, of inch and a half, they could get two 100 foot lines. What's not to like about an inch and a half or inch and three quarter line if your entire life you've been pulling two and a half to put out a room and contents fire in a residential structure. So, you know, uh, so you have line control issues. Then we have all the backup problems, right? We have an unknown number of companies operating off it. And then, you know, it's not really a backup line. It'll never be stretched one length longer easily. Now we talked about Detroit. Here's something interesting Detroit does. One side of the Y is 150 feet and the other side of the Y is 100 feet, but they pump for the 150 foot flow. Uh, they pump the friction loss for the longer legs. So the shorter legs over pressurized a little bit. Uh, so they have a different, you know, often that longer line is for the exterior, but they can take it interior. So again, if you're gonna copy somebody, you can't just uh, read something on the internet. You got to go talk to that agency and see why they do it. You know, they have some very specific reasons uh, of the evolutions they did. Now, Daryl mentioned um, Chicago, right? And if you look, uh, you look at, uh, I'm going to bring up another slide, but Chicago, that Y evolution is not a longstanding evolution in that department. It's only been around three decades and there's a lot of people that don't like it. Um, Chief Hoff, when he left Chicago, I had the fortunate uh, uh, honor to teach at Carroll Stream where he went. And uh, I looked at his engines and there were wise off the standard Chicago 
play two and a half to a nozzle down to a hundred foot leader, but there was no why. And I, you know, chief Hoff, why, why is there no why on the Carroll stream rig? He's like, I never liked them. It's lazy. If you're a company, you should stretch your own line. I don't like having two lines tied to one trunk line. I think it hurts the first line. It, it hurts where the second line is positioned. He had all sorts of reasons that I believed in, but he couldn't get it done in his own organization. So he leaves Chicago and he, he in his mind fixed it in his new organization. So again, it's back to that Tolstoy quote. It's very important to look at things with fresh eyes. Um, Daryl, you want to add anything or Jerry? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because uh, we both have friends in that department. And when I've asked um, some of the issues they've had with the why, I was, I was surprised that most of them were very upfront saying, yeah, we have issues with it quite, quite a bit. You know, uh, the, the other leg getting open when there's no line attached to it. Um, they talked about cutting off handles as far as some companies cutting off the other handle. Mm -hmm. So it will not get turned on accidentally if it, if it gets dragged during the firefight. And a lot of companies are bungeeing uh, closed the opposite handle because they're primarily stretching it as an initial line and that other leg being used for, you know, uh, a mop up or things like that. The other yeah, thing so you, mentioned, you mentioned that fire in uh, Oakland uh, for people watching, we, we eliminated this operation in Oakland in 2004, but prior to that, it was an evolution we would we would do called baby lines if it was a stretch over 300 feet. So we weren't very good at it, I, I don't think, because it was a, a recovery move for that oddball stretch when something was over 300 feet. And um, so I was you know, privy to how some of those operations uh, would go. So I, I think, oh, oh, go ahead, Jerry. Jerry. You bring up an interesting point. I, I think a lot of this comes down to the frequency. So it, your old setup was, was a low frequency, but it had a higher probability for error. And, you know, I don't know, we, we find this a lot in the field when, when you start to talk to somebody about where they use a Y and how, and whether they've actually hooked another line to it. Uh, this comes up frequently in standpipe uh, discussions, um, and the answer is rare it, that, that there's ever another line hooked to it. And you, you brought up some some interesting points. I mean, have you ever seen a Y charged in a hallway that wasn't kicked or didn't roll when it was charged and kicked the other leg open? And and that's why you see people cutting them off. So I think you know when you start to evaluate your operations based on a frequency, if if it's the majority of the time it's being used to reduce a line as opposed to duplicate and have another line, it's a pretty easy fix. But conversely, if you have a higher frequency of its use and it's working, and you mentioned a couple of cities where it does, it's because they drill to that paradigm, but they're also extremely streamlined in what their line pull choice is. So, you know, it, it, you go back to when we had inch and a half and two and a half, it was pretty obvious which to pull. Then we, uh, uh, as the fire service does, we complicated things by introducing intermediate line sizes, inch and three quarter or two inch and different varying lengths of pre-connected lines. And that's, it goes back to uh, the simplicity of the first line on the fire backed up by a second line committed off of a separate supply. It's not unlike the concept of having, you know, multiple pumpers supplying the fire in case you have a mechanical issue. So you, you know, it's the whole eggs in one basket thing, but um, I'm glad you presented it the way because it does work well for some that have a higher frequency of its use as opposed to where it doesn't work well as a more low frequency. It's the squirrely lay over 300 feet that we're doing rarely and we're introducing things that can complicate the issue of getting the first line on the fire. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta, before, before we move on here, I'm gonna pop up a question just to break it up here. Um, okay. That's kind of relevant right now is what we're talking about, but Charlie Dahl is asking, um, is there any situation where a Y uh, can benefit the first line? Well, um, we're, we're I, talking, oh, go ahead, Dennis. No. I would think certain fire, I wouldn't want to remove it off the, I was given permission to remove all of them off every rig in Oakland. Okay. Um, uh, wasn't well liked for it. The operations chief allowed me to do it. Uh, there were hidden, you know, uh, but 
it's not, it's not, it's like a real line. It's not the real line's fault. It gets dragged inside a building. So let's say I pulled up to some type of unique fire and I'm going to think of one from a previous life. I went to a, uh, a, uh, walnut hauling operation where there was a bunch of, uh, walnut shells on fire and it was like spread out exterior at uh, the blue diamond almond factory in Kings County. Well, it's an exterior firefight. I'm going to need multiple lines. They're probably going to be operated not in a simultaneous manner, but maybe a sequential manner. And I'm not really super, no one's in a compartment. Nobody's inside a burning building. And I, and I'm going to have a limited volunteers are showing up or more people are coming. I'm going to, and everyone can see everyone outside. There's no smoke. No one's going to kick the Y shut. There's no pedestrian traffic. And I'm like, oh, well, this is a perfect uh, example. Some people might call it a water show type fire, but you know, a Y in that scenario or a Y in a wildland scenario where you want to make a pincer attack and both, both wild, it's a progressive hose lay and you're starting from an anchor point and both wildland inch and halfs are only going to be flowing 60 gallons a minute. It's perfect. So when you look at the Y and you take the structure fire element out, the compartment element out, uh, it's still a very good uh, device to turn one line into two uh, when you're not looking for a critical target flow. Uh, to go back to Chicago and to present some solutions here, one of the things as a consultant, when an agency doesn't want to give up their Y operation, I try to move them the three inch hose to supply it. Then on the unused outlet, I have them screw on a cap and I drill a little eight, eighth inch hole in it. So no matter if the thing gets kicked open, kicked shut, it's not going to get hydraulically locked on the Y, but it's also going to bleed that pressure off. It gives you a visual cue that that other handle is open and it makes it so the first company only has to tie one handle open and not the other one closed. So, you know, uh, if you're going to have to use it, you know, hydraulically improve your trunk line, keep your legs to under 150 gallons a minute, cap that unused outlet, uh, but remember, you're require that initial line's supposed to be fast and it's supposed to apply water quick. And three inch doesn't move around the fire ground very fast. But I might suggest that to a rural fire department. They have a bridge that a rig can't drive across. You have a bridge, here's another one, Dolly. There, there's, there's a bridge the rig can't drive across and you want two hand lines down by that house fire and it's 300 feet down a private driveway. Well, if I have 300 feet of three inch and I have two inch and three quarters down there, I'm gonna say that's better than stretching two individual lines if you're staffing light. Does that help? I'll, uh, I'll weigh in on that. Uh, first of all, hi, Charlie. Charlie was uh, at HROC where um, I I do every year a, a stretch up to the 13th floor of a high-rise building next to the host hotel in that situation we're doing a lot of work to get a line we call an improvised standpipe up the side of a high-rise building it's a tremendous amount of weight we simulate going up a high-rise building where uh um trying to simulate like the deutsche bank situation where you could be up a high-rise with a inoperable standpipe and you have to use your packs to make an improvised standpipe by lowering the packs down to the ground and uh, charging that. And you have to tie it off. It's a tremendous amount of weight. It's a lot different than just dropping it off the, the third or fourth floor balcony of, a, of an apartment. We're talking about a lot of weight. Uh, Dennis and I did this off the 17th floor there at the Riviera in Vegas. It's a lot of work to get one line in place, and I would not be opposed to having a gated Y in that situation so we can have a second line uh, in, in place for that. And that would be for an initial attack, but for just basic fires, I think we're really trading, uh, setting up for the second line at a cost of efficiency uh, and reliability of, of the first line. Other than that, Dennis brought up some wildland situations, but also if your rigs do not have a Siamese, not all of, all of our rigs have a Siamese, that tool could be very valuable to get a second line into a vandalized or damaged 
fire department connection for your sprinkler stand type system. Um, and so you should definitely have these devices on the rig, but uh, other than that, I can't really think of too many times I think it would be valuable. So it's, it's still a viable appliance, just not in its historical perception of use. I'm going to pop up another one here, guys, that I think is pretty good. Uh, Chris Reese is asking, if the engineer pumps the trunk line for two bundles of the same flow and length, does the initial line actually lose flow? Um, if you can do it simultaneously, no. Like if you, The old rules that I was taught uh, when the baby lines existed in Oakland is you always pump the two line flow. So, you know, we had three inch hose uh, and we did a thing called a schoolyard. So our hand lines were only flowing a hundred gallons a minute. So the friction loss difference was like one PSI for hundred GPM and like two or three PSI for 300 GPM. So we always pumped it like both lines were flowing because there wasn't a huge differential in the trunk line. Um, so uh the the short answer is no the long answer is if it's two and a half inch shows and both of the legs are flowing they the rules are they have to be equal length equal flow and equal nozzle pressure so let's say you follow all those rules and you have 30 psi in the 100 feet inch and three quarter and 50 at the nozzle that's 80 and then you have a trunk line of let's say 200 feet well at 150 gallons a minute, two and a half is only about five PSI per hundred. So it's 10 PSI total. At 300 gallons a minute, both of them flowing, it's closer to 20 PSI. So that's 40, 40 PSI total. So that's a 30 PSI difference. So if you pump 40 PSI in that 200 feet of two and a half and the 80, sure, both lines are going to work fine. And now you set your relief valve or you set your governor. Now, when one line shuts down, a large majority of that extra pressure is going to go to the other line and make it uncontrollable. And that's that's the thing the old evolution had an advantage over the modern flow, that the trunk line was big enough, hydraulically efficient enough uh, to support easily 200 gallon minute flow. So Daryl mentioned San Francisco. And one of the reasons it works in San Francisco is they their target flow in their hand lines is 160 gallons a minute, but they always supply it with three inch hose and their three inch hose has an advantage over most people's three inch hose. It's three inch hose with three inch couplings. And if you go measure it, it's three inch hose that really measures out three and a quarter inches. So essentially they don't have a huge trunk line balancing issue. However, they do have tactical problems. Uh, when they have interruption of flow in one of their lines, it's so common for the Y to be partially shut or kick shut, they automatically go check it. Uh, some of their buildings are so large, deep, and voluminous, the Y ends up inside the building. Now, uh, 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 civilian traffic can end up kicking things on or off or shut off. Now, they address it. Uh, they assign somebody there or somebody's there or if they have problems, they know to go look to me. If you know you're having problems, maybe you should stop that evolution. You know, same with Chicago, the companies that cut the handle down. Some of them I've seen caps welded on the other side. The people in Chicago that really like the second outlet are the squad companies. They're allowed to bring a bundle in and in an emergency use a second outlet. And it's been something that's been in place since 1980. Before 1980, they had the same setup without the why. And if you look at the history of why they put the second outlet in, there's all sorts of rumors around it. But something I found interesting is Riverside County in California does the Chicago setup. And you go down and talk to them, and you go like, you know, Chicago really doesn't use the other outlet for anything except the overhaul. Uh, most companies stretch their own line. They go, no, we don't know that. And they, I'm like, you know, you're using Chicago's setup and they don't know it either. So again, like history is everything. You need to go back. If you're not using it like the people that use it daily, it doesn't mean it's gonna work for you. Perfect example of why the cut and paste solution doesn't work. Any other questions there, Chris? Um, 
That Matt Dory uh, has a three inch to a ram uh, to a wide, a two inch and three quarter, which is uh, it, not, not an uncommon thing to see, you know, a ram or an appliance like that for a large hit and then uh, a reduction to a, an attacking hand line. Um, you're basically just an extension of the pump penalty. You're still going to have the same issues of, of hydraulic balance on, on two legs of a Y. Um, ideal spot for a reduction uh, to, to a single line for mop up or an interior attack after a big hit. But um, you're going to end up in the exact same situation that you were that we were just talking coming off the pump panel for balance. There's no way to hydraulically balance a Y unless you've got gauges, throttle control, and the chauffeur at that point. Uh, in, you know, you guys covered that so well in, in the series, and that was the comparison of, of, you know, the flows. It worked well. It started on the pump panel on a 500 or 750 GPM pumper with the operator at the Y, and then it left the rig and the complication started because we started doing an additional line without the operator's control at the Y, which is now the control point. So an extension of the pump panel. So I looks like Matt Dory. It looks like his picture's up there, and it you know it could be different. I don't know if it's a firefighter's badge, it's just a gold badge. So I'm gonna assume he's a chief. So I either gave you a field promotion or uh, or you're a different rank. So I'm just gonna say you're a chief. And one thing as a consultant, when I point out evolutions like this, um, you're taking something that just gave you the advantage, and you're permanently removing it from the IC's repertoire. Right. So if I was managing a fire and a RAM monitor just made a great hit on a strip mall or some sort of auto body shop, and now I'm going to commit people to the interior while that hits going on, I would rather have other companies stretch their own lines. I shut the RAM down. They go inside. Heaven forbid there's a rapid change in fire conditions or something. And now I have a RAM uh, that I can open up and suppress that rapid fire condition. If you take something on the battleground and you convert it to something else, you have now lost that chess piece as an IC or company officer on the fire ground. Now, where I would say this is totally acceptable, let's say you show up, you take the RAM and it's just a real open strip mall and essentially you've taken it to an overhaul situation and you like these inch and three quarters are really just overhauling this. I'm going to say that's okay. But during actual suppression, I don't like converting lines. You know, if you, someone stretches a two and a half somewhere and it's done a really good job of knocking the fire and I'm the company officer, I'm going to get on the radio and say, hey, I need more mobility where I'm at. I'm not going to say that on the radio. I'm just going to say, give me an inch and three quarter to my location, make it a five length stretch. Maybe I've stretched short the two and a half. Maybe there's pallets I need to go around, but I want that two and a half there for safety. I, I take my inch and three quarter and the other company gets in there and it it's not going as well as I thought. I still have my two and a half. Same scenario here. Great answer to the question, Matt. Thank you. All right, Dennis, you want to keep cruising through your slides here? Yeah, sure. Why don't you bring up uh uh let's bring up slide number six. So uh, full disclosure, all these pictures uh, I've, I've found consulting, uh, the why issue ones uh, on that slide where it showed it on a stairwell. You know, typically what I do uh, is I'll just ask a chief to allow me to bring companies down to a drill tower and I'll just have them do their standard evolutions and I'll take pictures and I'll just kind of point out areas where, hey, there's some weakness here. What, has this ever happened on a fire ground? And if you talk to people for long enough and they're open and honest and realize there's going to be no discipline, we're only talking about, I, I think essentially we all have the same goal. We want to maximize life and property preservation on the fire ground through the best water movement and search practices uh, uh, and ventilation practices that we can do. And a lot of that's based on, you know, rigorously looking at your stuff over and over again. So this, this slide here, you know, it's the Chicago setup there on the lower left. Um, Riverside copied it. If you, uh, I'll put it, I'll try to find it and put it up in the comments. About four years ago, uh, Riverside deployed a two and a half on the fire ground, used the two and a half to knock down a bunch of fire. Uh, 
did this Y operation off the front. And during the fire attack, whether it was a civilian or not, somehow the two and a half inch shutoff majority got closed. And there were several members that received mild to moderate burns because they lost both hand lines inside the building. So before you before you copy somebody, um, you need to know uh, why it was in place. I'm trying to bring the slide up so I can see all the uh, type that's on there. Um, let me just take a quick look at the, the uh, exact type here. All right, so the triple failure, that's what the slides called in my presentation, right? So um, you're trying to make something do something it was never designed to do, right? So you have uh, you have a two and a half inch and then a nozzle, which is an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half to inch and a half. Why? Well, you got to know the history. That's Chicago setup. They rarely use the second outlet. I was told it was initiated during a shortage of hose uh, of two and a half inch hose and they were still in cotton jacket. So there was a somebody's solution for an overhaul outlet. Eventually, it became an outlet that was used by the squad companies in emergencies. And then, like many things, there's some complacency. It gets used more often. And now it's back to being very rarely used in that organization. So in Riverside at Cal Fire, they put out a statewide green sheet that talks about this particular setup leading to uh, some burns of some Riverside County contract Cal Fires. And it's a public document. Uh, I'll try to find it and put it in the com in, in the in the uh, comments. If anybody uh, wants it, they can reach me too at my email, and I'll I'll give you a Dropbox link to it. Um, the center one there, it's a very large fire department. They don't have promoted uh, pump operators. A lot of large fire departments do that because it's easier for shift purposes. It's easier to fill shifts. You know, there's four. There's three good examples of this on the West Coast: San Francisco. Um, Portland, Oakland, and Seattle, none of their pump operators are promoted. Now, often uh, someone find, finds the inch and a half to two and a half inch increaser and they screwed it on the other side of the Y. You know, if it, if it screws together, it must work, right? You know, faith-based hydraulics, right? So, you know, they couldn't give me an answer of why it was like this, but they, they didn't also say they would never attach a two and a half to the other side, right? So, you know, you have to have an understanding of the pump operating and the movement of water. Obviously, you can't supply a two and a half and an, and an inch and a half outlet off the same trunk line, expect it to work properly, right? Um, the other one is that often a fire department will approach a vendor for a solution. This happened in Montgomery County. They really wanted to keep their Y operation. Um, so they wanted it, they wanted a pressure gauge up there. So uh, a company did make this uh, Y for them, but often it creates new problems. Like so, init the initial line it's all pre connected on the rig, and the initial hundred feet of small line is off the ungated outlet. Well, what if that outlet? What if that hand line burns through, and the other line is being used? You end up with no way to control it. There's no shut off. Uh, down at that side. So sometimes there's just no uh, easy solution. Sometimes the easiest solution is to remove something uh, from their from their procedures and see see if it works better. The things that I don't like about Y operations the most is most people are grabbing a bundle and making and breaking connections on the fire ground. You know, Montgomery County, it was already pre-connected. Fresno, it's already pre-connected. So it's still a fairly rapid pull, but you're dealing with a larger size line and you're only getting a hundred feet of your, your small line, but at least it's semi-quick. Um, if you start putting a stopwatch to some of these evolutions and you just go to a bell reducer and some amount of hose beyond the bell reducer, you're gonna see these evolutions get done quicker, faster, charged quicker. Uh, and have less problems. So fire departments I've directly influenced. Um, Seattle's gotten rid of the Y. Boise's gotten rid of the Y. Portland will put a bulk bed on. And basically most companies just could pull the bulk bed. Um, they still have a Y on there. Again, like we talked, there are places for Ys. Um, Tualatin Valley outside of Portland. Clackamas. Uh, Richmond, Virginia. Mountain View. Uh, 
Palo Alto and here, Modesto, there's, there's a bunch of places that have gotten rid of the Y that I've directly been involved with. And it's not because I have the power to hypnotize people. That's crazy. Like I couldn't, I couldn't convince all these big departments to change something just because I had an opinion on it. They went out and did it and they found out doing it a different way worked better for them. Right. So, uh, ultimately the proof's in the pudding, right? I mean, why is the why being questioned so much? Um, it's, did it really do what we thought it did in the structural firefighting world now that we have modern flows? And one interesting thing about Chicago is they were the first one to move the high flow fogs. And at that same time as when they added the why. So it, sometimes you don't have all the pieces. Yeah, I, I had a, a question. Uh, someone texted me uh, yesterday from a neighboring uh, fire department. Darryl, be closer to your machine. Okay. I had a friend that texted me from a neighboring fire department that Dennis and I uh, uh, were pretty close with. And he said, hey, Daryl, uh, I just saw your video on the gated Y. He watched the brass tax videos. What do you suggest to replace that setup? And it's just something that was uh, not talked about in those videos, and Dennis is hinting at that. Um, it's simply, uh, in a nutshell, would be having a, a bulk bed or dead load or static bed, a hose, whatever you want to call it, and having a, a line that you can stretch short or long and you can go beyond the length of your typical pre-connect. Now you can have this along with your pre-connect, so you can have it in lieu of your pre-connect and, and getting uh, rid of them in, entirely, which is you know crazy talk to some people. But I, I do like static beds from short to long stretches. And the second line is is critically important, but it's going to be a new stretch off of another static bed now in my city we only have one static bed unlike a like an fdny engine company has two static beds so the second inch and three quarter is another inch and three quarter bed uh other than their squad companies which has a single static bed so if you need a second long line we would stretch off of a, of a vicinity engine static bed to that place and disconnect it and hook it to the pumping engine. Okay, okay so Daryl, yeah, yeah, go Chris, ahead. If Chris, if Chris brings up slide eight for you, it would help your description. So okay. Chris, if you can hear me, bring up slide eight. It's gonna be a picture of 13 engines. I think it's there, it might be 12 engines, rear hose bed there. Okay, so this, uh, thanks Dennis, and I'll let you uh, speak. Uh, on this, but um, we, we color coat the hose, which I really like because it's very easy for anybody on the fire ground to see the diameter of the hose just by the color of it. It's one thing that I like. Uh, I think it's better than, than FDNYs, which is just all white and very difficult to see the exact size. But the blue hose there is two and a half. So you can see we have a bulk bed of two and a half. You can stretch that to where you need. If you need a second two and a half, you're going to add a nozzle to that coupling that's exposed, and then you'll, you can stretch your second line. An inch and three quarter is a little more complicated because it's not just all inch and three quarter. So we can stretch that line at 150 feet up to uh, five or 600 feet, depending on, on the engine. But... It can really be as long as you want. You could have eight, 900 feet of hose there. But we have 300 feet of inch and three quarter. We just have a reducer. It happens to be a bell reducer. And then we have it connected to two and a half. So friction loss isn't getting too high if the stretch is longer than 300 feet. Okay, so we have one bed like that. And so if it was a, um, a second line needed, we would stretch a second one off of a vicinity engine and hook it to the pumping engine, or you can start to get into more complications, but you can stretch a two and a half with a pack or, or pull a two and a half inch line, and we still have pre-connected 
lines off the crossway, which are used probably most often in, in our organization, is the is the pre-connect. But um, this load is very similar to Portland's and uh, FDNY's uh, static bed, but that's really the solution is having each line its own independent line. If you have a backup line, it's truly a backup line from start to finish. Every stretch is an original stretch. You're not going to a Y and then assuming that the second line is needed within that 100 feet. So if it has to go to a carport or a floor above or another area of the building, it's a new stretch from start to finish. And then each line has its own gauge. So you're not going to have any hydraulic balance issues um, when you hook up the second line. So we're not under mining the necessity of that second line it's just each line is its own stretch which is interesting most of america is down with this when it comes to two and a half that's what we we do every the second two and a half is always a new stretch we're not usually operating off of a, another y and our two and a half stretches are usually some of our longer stretches because they're often in commercial occupancies but it comes to the smaller inch and a half an inch and three quarters, we're often tying ourselves to this, this appliance. So, uh, Dennis, you want to weigh in on your, uh, your photo here? Yeah. So, um, you know, you can't get everything you want right away. And obvi uh, obviously, I uh, left the fire department, Oakland, uh, right around 20, 2010. Um, you know, I, I personally would like to see two inch and three quarter bulk beds on the back of an Oakland rig. Uh, the am I not muted? Am I? Can people hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay, I I couldn't remember whether I turned the mute off or not. So um, so you know uh, there there were also other issues. You know, uh, Daryl was the chair of the hose and nozzle committee. I was a uh, captain in a water supply cap uh, in a company, but I also had the dual role of being a water supply captain and. You know, one thing that I had to decide on was, uh, you know, with the help of the operations chief and the senior captain downtown uh, and a bunch of other people is what were we going to do on the supply side? So I spent a lot of time with the surveyor wheel rolling out supply line stretches and also looking at attack stretches. And you'll notice in that picture, the female coupling is exposed on uh, the two and a half and that inch and three quarter that's on top of some two and a half. And what I discovered is those two are only 500 feet wrong, but there, there were definitely places in the city where we would need more than 500 feet in the large line. And every now and then we would need more than 500 feet in the small line from the rig, depending on the building, the setback, uh, the amount of vertical, whether there's a well hole present or not. So the solution for us was to have that female coupling exposed and you can't see it, but the green hose to the right is three inch. So, there's 500 feet of that. So as a person that was involved in designing it, I figured, okay, I can stretch any hand line size up to a thousand feet away from an Oakland rig. Uh, and that makes 99.9% .9 of the city within uh, the stretch envelope of function. So that's one way that we fixed it. One downside to that is that the two and a half 500 feet of two and a half where you deploy a second line like the first line's 300 feet well there's only 200 feet of two and a half left i still want to be able to screw a nozzle on there and pull a second two and a half off the rig but that'll allow us to fill it out with three inch hose the inch and three quarter the nice thing about a bulk bed is often when 200 feet's not going to make it which there is a pre-connect on this rig a cross lay that's 200 feet you don't need 300 feet. You don't need 350 feet. You usually only need 250 or 300. So normally you're only dealing with the small line to begin with. But if you don't need 300, you might need 350. So we've turned it into a single evolution. You pull up, if for some reason the company officer doesn't think the 200 foot's gonna make it or the firefighter's making his own call, there's one location to go to and there's only one evolution to do. Uh, we could have had a blitz line on here pre-connected to the two and a half inch discharge on the rear. We used to have it 200 feet. Uh, often it was much too long when you use it at a residential fire to knock down some exterior fire. And 
often it was too short and commercial. So by going to just a single bulk bed of two and a half, uh, we turned it into a single evolution. So often again, by creating a single evolution, you're going to get better performance on the fire ground. There's no guessing. There's no opening a compartment. There's no getting a Y. There's no like, is it exactly 300 feet? Is it 350? Is it 250? You might go around a corner and have everybody stacked up on a bulk bed and go like, oh, there's a well hole right here. And you, you, you don't end up with a mess. You can just dump your hose there and bring the working length up with you in the well hole. So, um, those are powerful hey, uh, things. And hey, Dennis. Yep. Yeah. We're going to pop up a question here real quick um, from Greg. I think it's pretty applicable what we're talking to you about right now. He's asking uh, high-rise SOGs, if they call for the second line to be a two-inch off of the Y, it sounds like is this current SOG, I'm assuming there, Greg. Um, any comments on, on that? So uh, I know Greg, uh, if – uh, he works in St. Louis, the city of St. Louis. Um, we had the same thing on uh, our high rise system. We used a Y and we used two inch and a half off, off the standpipe outlet. And Anthony Rowett from uh, Port City Fire Training and uh, Mobile, Alabama, uh, has done a lot of hydraulic work with Ys off standpipe outlets. And the problem with the standpipe outlet, it's technically a restricting device. And if it happens to have a pressure reducing valve uh, on it, it's not gonna work well at all uh, to have a second line off it. And if it happens to be a valve uh, that can't be opened all the way, you're gonna have substantial problems too. And if you look at NFPA 14 uh, uh, and, you, and you see what they rate a single outlet is, they call it out, it's 250. And now a lot of two inch and three quarters might flow 360 gallons a minute uh, if they're both 15 sixteenths. So you end up trying to stuff 365 gallons through something that was really only designed to flow 250. And then if it happens to be either a pressure reducing device or pressure reducing valve, you're gonna run into large uh, issues. So again, it's in the standpipe, it's good one outlet, one line, one pressure gauge, uh, one elbow with a drain. You should be duplicating the pump panel on the on the uh, on the floor that you're connecting to. They should have a gate that they control. They should have a drain in case the hose gets stuck under a door or some object, and they should have a pressure gauge they can read. You provide it at every other fire. You know the funny thing when you really think about it, at 99% of fires that are handled with pre-connects provide exactly what I'm discussing. One outlet, a drain, a gauge, a guy with his hand on the handle and a guy on the a guy on the nozzle that has a bail and that's it. And then somehow magically when you talk about getting rid of something, it's like, well you don't use it on any of those other fires. How do you know it works as good as you think it works? And the 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 brass tacks, let's just use that uh, since it's uh, part of this, the brass tacks and hard fact about it is that often the second outlet is never used or it only charges a line. It's a secondary line that's used for overhaul. So most people have no idea of the problems that can occur when you use that line for actually fighting fire. And there's a great video that uh, it's not available to the public of a Seattle fire where you can see that when one line opens up, the other line gets driven back. When one line shuts down, they go back to proper flow and they can make an advance. And they're in automatic nozzles, so they can kind of they they can kind of get away with it. But ultimately, when they looked at it, they said, "This is not what we want to do." So they removed the Y operation from their years of tradition of using it. Now, is everybody happy with that decision? Of course not. Where did the Y culture and manifold culture come in the Seattle Fire Department? When I researched it, they had a bunch of wooden piers and you can't drive a fire engine out onto a wooden pier uh, when it's on fire because it might end up in the bay, right? It might end up in the sound. So they had a huge culture of manifolds and Y evolutions and deploying multiple lines off trunk lines down these old wooden piers and 
those peers aren't there anymore. They, the, the history, it worked then, but now the city is different now. And I think a lot of that has to do with why operations. And uh, I know what the other people weigh in. I'm going to pull up one more slide that kind of explains this a little bit. So yeah, go we, ahead. I'll, I'll weigh in while this other slide's coming up. Uh, and, and, and speaking to Greg, first of all, since I am sitting here in quarantine, I did watch a, a rescue live or whatever the A&E program is or something. And they had your fire department. You guys look like a fantastic fire department with a real good fire uh, on one of those episodes. But um, I, I teach at the uh, FDIC uh, where I taught with uh, McGrail for a number of years in the standpipe section. And we had great concerns of using a Y off of a standpipe for some other reasons as well. One is we want to lighten the load on firefighters just walking up these buildings. We don't want them carrying unnecessary weight if you're going to be hiking up uh, multiple stories. The other thing is um, you're hooking up an appliance that's going to require additional friction loss when you're flowing two lines. So you have to keep that in mind that we're flowing uh, off of a low, inherently low pressure system. And if you decide to hook up an appliance that when two lines are flowing, especially if you're talking about a two inch line flowing off of a two and a half to a uh, dual inch and a half uh, Y, you have to be aware of your friction loss because you're automatically introducing a lot of pressure requirements that your standpipe system may not have. Now, again, I know that a second line is needed, but you may want to just hook up to the next outlet on the floor below when that second line is called for. Okay, if you're you're saying that you may need a two inch line off of that Y, so I'm assuming that your initial line may not be two inch, maybe it's inch and three quarter and two inches a larger one. I'm not sure, but be aware that there is a significant friction loss when you're doing large flows on two lines off of a single uh, uh, gated Y. And we can still use that riser as a manifold and just hook up your second line to the next floor below or maybe even that, that fire floor at that time if, if conditions warrant that. What slide do uh, you need there, Dennis? Uh, I think let's go with uh, the only two slides left are seven and two, uh, no, four. four. Let's, let's, show four let's show four real quick because um, it goes back to that historical thing. Like you, you, you have a Y in your fire department and uh, why do you have a Y in your fire department? We have to think of the paradigm that the Y was initially designed under. First, small line was brand new to the fire service. There wasn't enough outlets on the rigs and all the outlets were two and a half. So the reason the most common Y is a two and a half to two inch and a half outlets, it was literally to allow the pump body to be split into two inch and a half discharges. So the Y was introduced in the 40s and 50s. And this fuel load, this is one of the few times, even as someone who's involved with the ULFSRI and NIST research type stuff, this is one of the few times I will say that when the Y came into existence in the structural firefighting world, the fires burned with more visibility, less production of smoke, and at a much slower rate. So having a slow evolution that was one or two minutes longer to get into place was no big deal. Um, and if you look on this graph here, the uh, red line is the legacy fire. You know, the uh, first arrow on the red line is uh, is uh, ventilation. Uh, is No, the second one is ventilation. The first one is vent limited. So it took it take like 20 minutes for a, a legacy fire to get the vent limited in the 50s and 60s. And then you open the door and it, you know, it didn't go crazy right away because it wasn't, there wasn't packed with dense, rich smoke that, that all it needs is oxygen. So we have to remember the Y evolution was brought in the, in the existence when there was not enough outlets on the rig. They just got inch and a half and it was under a different heat release rate, especially in time, right? So timing is everything on the fire ground. And when, when timing was, when you had good staffing or not good staffing, you either had a paid fire department or a volunteer fire department. There wasn't a lot of suburb fire departments. They didn't do EMS. 
there was some forgiveness in time here. We have very little, there's very little forgiveness in time once you change vent profile in a building that's packed with rich, dense, fuel-laden smoke. So, you know, in the presentation I give, I'll say, yes, the Y existed in this paradigm, but maybe no, the blue line, you know, the building, a 1500 square foot house is filled up with smoke and vent limited in the first five minutes, you open the door. And if you don't do anything in the next minute or two, you're going to have a flashover condition. You're going to have ceiling temperatures of 1500 degrees. So do you want to be making and breaking couplings on the fire ground and doing that kind of stuff under the new paradigm? You know, historically, it's very different. So I think the why, especially if you have to open a compartment, take it to a place, stretch a large amount of two and a half or three inch for probably a 250 fire. You know, it's like 250 feet from the rig, 300 feet from the rig. And now you're dealing with 200 feet of three inch where you could just have a 300 foot pre-connect, or you could just have six lengths of inch and three quarter of bell reducer. Um, and you could have, you could have that tip of the spear ready to go charged and not have to deal with all these other complications. So I think that's something that most people don't consider the history, when it, when and why it was implemented and not only when and why it was implemented, but they were dealing with a different fire dynamic at the time. Daryl, you wanna say anything about that? Yeah, I think um, when, when you're talking about the, the speed, you're, um, you're talking a lot about uh, forward lay fire departments that are laying to the scene and then they're going to be stretching off the rig and then uh, making and breaking these connections where, uh, as we've mentioned, the uh, departments such as like Chicago and Detroit, which we've mentioned several times uh, tonight, um, they're, not, they're not making and breaking connections and they're often reverse laying out to the, the, the hydrant or another company is bringing them in uh, their supply line. So they have speed because of familiarity, and they can it can still be a fast evolution, although there still could be some hydraulic uh, issues. So one thing we've said tonight is, you know, it works in some departments and maybe doesn't work in, in others. But I think that working part is familiarity of mechanically having firefighters stretch a line with these lies. But one thing that's going to be consistent, no matter what department you're in, are some of the hydraulic issues and some of the hydraulic complications, which we've talked about in the brass tax uh, uh, videos. So when it comes to speed, I think where uh, some organizations, uh, including my own, are going to lose speed is because this can be the, the odd evolution that's going beyond the pre-connect and kind of slowing some things down. Now, uh, when I talk to uh, my friend Jeff Shoup that uh, most of us know, when we were first looking at the static bed and the, the big concern seemed to be of it uh, possibly being taking longer than a pre-connect. And I knew Jeff had, you know, he'd been around the block. He's worked with a lot of departments and I asked him, is the static bed slower than a pre-connect? And since the Cleveland Fire Department is using a static bed, he said, you know, not for us because that's what we do every time. If it's a short stretch, it's a static bed. If it's a static bed, if it's a long stretch, it's a static bed. Um, I'm sure any department operating uh, simply always off of static beds, their speed is going to become just in the familiarity of the stretch. And so therefore, things are going to be faster. But I'll say something about timing and, and tying yourself to that stopwatch too much. If you're going to be out there timing this, stop the time when you're actually ready to engage in an attack. And that's when you've got your mask and gloves on and your helmet on, and you're actually ready to go in this building. Because to me, that seems to be the slowest part of, of this evolution. I... I, I... I would say that's fair. Um, uh, it's a very good point. Another point is, and it's something that uh, that we tried in Oakland. Um, the nice thing about a static bed, it's a perfect backup line. Let's say you need to stretch another inch and three quarter, and you don't know whether that first line stretch short, long, or whatever. You get the right size line every time. 
Um, Ray McCormick chimed in. He says the, you know, the second outlet is driving a person to consider the second line before the first line. We all know we should go to the first grade before we go to the second grade. And that the spec of the equipment's kind of saying, hey, look at the second grade, look at the second grade, you might miss it. You might miss the first grade. But some things uh, in Oakland, it, we have a 150 uh, in the cross lane number one and 200 based on policy. I know some companies might uh, manipulate that, but there is a policy. And the reason the policy is there is that on the east end, often 150 feet is too long. And for a little bit of time, we tried both cross lays 200 feet. And that was a nightmare for those companies because they have to get rid of maybe a length and a half or maybe even sometimes two lengths of hose because it's 20 feet to the front door and you're looking at a 1200 square foot bungalow. You really only need 100 feet of hose. So you can eat a pre-connect can lead to an overstretching condition. Um, and you see this a lot with people that have like 300 foot pre-connects. They go pull it. They only needed 200 feet barely. And now they have to deal with an extra 100 feet. And there's a there's a fence or something there. And it ends up being a big tangle of hose. Um, and or someone pulls a 300 foot pre-connect and then they say, oh, that one's stretched short. How do we back it up? Do you add another length to the other two? They don't have a static bed. Uh, San Francisco has a rule. They have a 150 live line, which is their their small inch and three quarter line. That's what they call them. And then a 200. If the 200 foot is pulled and someone asks for a second line, they automatically go to their Y static evolution supplied with three inch hose. Not because the 150 might not make it to the same location, is that too often they ended up, the second line ended up short. And if you keep the pre-connects the same length on the cross lays, people assume they have the same stretch potential but they might not. You might go to a minute man lay and they're not the same stretch potential. One pulls off the rig one direction and can go a full 200 feet. Someone calls for a second line. You got to go around the front of the rig or the back of the rig because it's a unidirectional speed pull. It's going to be 30 feet shorter. So often when I encourage people to put a static bed on the, on the rig, I don't like talking about going long. I like saying it's good for everything. <laughs> You can go two lengths, you can go one length, you can go six lengths. Someone stretched short in the 200 and you need 250. Uh, you have a writ activation and you need some water to the Charlie side of the building, not tomorrow, you need it now. There's one place to go to, you know? So that's kind of where slide seven's headed, Chris. Kind of like you don't know what you don't know until you get it, so. Daryl, you might like looking at this slide, this slide seven. Um, I think something that's hard for people to grasp is that you can capture, it's possible to capture failure as success. And if you're not routinely using the second outlet of the Y, it might be giving you a false sense of security. It could be normalizing deviance. Now here we have the Challenger explosion. It makes a nice Y picture, right? You know, why did it happen, right? It's because they normalized a deviant behavior. And, you know, the Y outlet at times, if you're not doing it like Detroit does it, you put it on the ground, it's all pre-connected, the rig drives away, it's their standard practice. It's, it's that outline evolution. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. That's attributed to Mark Twain. Is that second outlet doing what you really think it does? That's what you need to ask yourself. Dennis, just because water's coming out doesn't mean you're doing it right? Yeah, correct. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the real problem with water is it's so damn good. It's delicious to drink and it puts out fire so good. <laughs> if you wanted. If you wanted firemen to get really good at their jobs, if we could just make water four times less effective, <laughs> uh, we have a lot of guys out there doing lots of evolution. But you know, even water done improperly often works, especially at our room and contents fires. Yeah. Hey, Dennis, Dennis, one thing that I like um, with the static bed, even though we have a choice of uh, pre-connecting the static bed, 
uh, my firefighters know that I want them to shut off the static bed, irregardless of, uh, you know, if a pre connect is going to reach or not. Now, um, one reason for that is not that a 150 or 200 isn't going to work, but it takes something as a company officer off of my shoulder because I have, uh, you know, we're a medium sized department, but I haven't. Uh, been to a fire with every one of the, the members and I don't it, it takes something off my shoulders to not have to be concerned if they're going to stretch short or stretch too long and have a huge pile of hose up at the front door or come up short and we have to grab a pack if they go to the static bed and they grab their working length I know they're going to have enough working length to get to the door and the line's going to be sufficiently long enough to get, to get us to where we need to go. And then from that point, all we have to do is, you know, uh, once I call for water, my driver knows that's going to be the call to break the line and connect it to the rig. We still have to estimate how much hose we need, but I can estimate the amount of hose from the building. So if I get to the front of a Victorian and I see that the fire's on the third floor and maybe I need two lengths in front of the building, I could get two lengths in front of the building and call for water but i didn't have to make that call down the driveway or through an obstruction of trees and smoke where i couldn't exactly see what it is or maybe i can get to the front of the building and and you know uh our district we've got uh every place is chopped up into you know two or three units some of them we have to enter uh on the side or even in the rear of, of the building so all I have to do is have that firefighter grab their hose and go towards, you know, the, the entry point of the fire. And I know that they're not going to get there with too much or too little. And it takes that uh, complication off my shoulders. And it really seems to simplify operations. That simplification seems to be a common theme throughout pretty much everything we do. Um, let, let's let's try and wind this to, towards the end. There's There's been a bunch of questions. We've put some up. We can't get them to them all, but um, everybody on the screen will make a commitment after we wrap to get on and, and try and engage uh, to those questions. Um, the, the, the reason we try and get you to watch the segment prior to this in our new format, the Sunday to Wednesday is so, uh, it, and, and tonight's a great example. Um, we had some really great questions that solidified some of the original testing and research that was done by, by Dennis and Daryl, and, and, and by far was one of our, 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 our best uh, segments. Um, there's, there's still an apathy that prevails, it seems, uh, because of the way we've done things. And, and it's not just with WISE, it's, it's in a lot of uh, different evolutions that we do. So, and I think that's the challenge that we all have to walk away with. You know, in this new training format that we've got that we're forced to use, um, there's still a lot of value to it. Uh, the, 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 the questions are consistent with what they would be if we were to face to face. Uh, we appreciate all the input. Absolutely. Uh, we've had a great turnout. We apologize for the problems. Um, it will be up on our all our media formats, uh, uh, hopefully without those challenges. Um, I know Chris has got something he wants to put up before we go. But uh, a real quick closing statement uh, from me, Daryl, Dennis, thanks so much again for being a part of this. Um, you, you two are dynamic too, that feed off each other with the subject matter. Um, the value of the fact that you both came out of an organization that went through radical change um, uh, is, is very apparent when you start to get on the same subject matter. I really appreciate your input. Well, thank, well, thank you, you very much. much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank, thank you guys both. both. Chris? Thanks, guys. Yep. I'm going to pop up real quick here, guys. This is a lifeline. Um, Everything is at BrassTaxHardFacts.com. So if you need to go deep on any of these other episodes or you're looking for a drill to do in the firehouse in the morning to get your shift going or to keep your day going, um, hit up BrassTaxHardFacts.com. There's uh, over 70 episodes of content out there. Um, if you need anything from us, we can reach us. Check out our stuff at OakCarBrass.com. We are on pretty much every social platform on there, uh, including TikTok. So if you're, uh, you know, really bored in the quarantine here and you just made a TikTok profile because you've found the end of the Internet, uh, find us and uh, give us a follow. 
And um, also to remind everybody, we are part of the Safe Fleet family. So Elkar Brass is a Safe Fleet brand. What that means is we are grouped up with FRC, Film Pro, and ROM, and the um, Fire EMS and Industrial Group. So I encourage you to check out safely.net slash FEI. That is all of our brands. That is all the latest and greatest stuff you can get from all four of us. So if you're specking out a rig, if you've got questions, if you want to get to see a demo, any of this stuff, uh, we really appreciate it. So thanks for tuning in. We'll pop this up on our YouTube channel um, uh, tomorrow. And um, tune in. We got some stuff lined up. I think we're going to stick with this time. Wednesday is 8 p.m. Eastern. Send us some direct messages. Who'd you like to see in what? episodes you'd like us to go deeper on and we're glad to do that so everybody stay safe safe healthy and uh we will talk soon